Al Mohler recently made some waves when he interviewed Daniel Hummel on his new book, The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism. I'm going to invite a special guest on today's podcast, and we're going to address some of the concerns that we have with that interview, as well as helping people understand what exactly does characterize dispensationalism. You're not going to want to miss part one of this important series. This is The Bible Sojourner, where we discuss issues related to the Bible, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, professor of Old Testament and Biblical Languages at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Shalom and welcome. Thanks for joining. This is not a natural reading of Scripture. That was one of the first responses of people, say, in the Reformed world, you know, to hearing dispensationalism. Like, hey, you know, no one would read the Bible uh, and, and just come to that. Instead, it kind of fits that 19th century idea that there's this overarching structure that's invisible till you see it, then you see it, you can't not see it. There's no way that uh, dispensationalism uh, can be defined as simple. And, and right. so that, that, that's the, uh, the irony here, the anomaly in my mind, because it, I can understand the, the purity effort and appreciate it and uh, the restorationist uh, concern. But how you get from that to the complexity of dispensationalism, still, it's, it's, it's still a leap in my mind. Well, what you just listened to was a clip from a recent interview that Al Mohler had where he interviewed a book author, Daniel Hummel, who I have his book right here. It's called The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, How the Evangel Evangelical Battle Over the End Times Shaped a Nation. And in this interview, it was on his podcast, Thinking in Public, as he interviewed Hummel, it became apparent that there perhaps was an ax to grind with dispensationalists. And I thought this was a great opportunity to invite my good friend, Doug Bookman, who teaches with me at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. I wanted to invite Bookman onto the episode here and talk a little bit about dispensationalism. You know, it's actually, I don't know if you knew this or not, uh, Book, but uh, the episodes that we usually do on dispensationalism are usually the most listened to and most viewed. So it's an interesting topic for people, even those who disagree, which I've had listeners tell me, you know, this is, I, I listen because I think, you know, it's a good place to have a conversation. And I disagree with you, but I think you do a fair job. So these kinds of conversations are really helpful on a broad, uh, broad spectrum. And so I thought uh, reviewing this podcast would be helpful, except for the fact that there have been others who have reviewed the ins and outs of the podcast episode. And in talking with you, I think we're both on the same page here, that there are actually some deeper issues involved. And so do you want to maybe comment on that? Yes, thank you so much. And I'm delighted to be part of this. And, and um, in point of fact, the episode, the podcast episode was titled The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism. And I think I did, and I think most people who were at all familiar with the debate between dispensationalism and non-dispensationalism, that this would be something of a discussion of the merits of dispensationalism vis-a-vis -vis whatever set of hermeneutical and theological principles uh, might, might be held. And, and it was none of that. Uh, it, was a, uh, uh, it, was, it was a disappointment in many ways. Even those of us who knew, who do not believe, that dispensationalism has fallen or is dead, who believe, as Mark Twain once said, that you know the, the reports of his death, the rumors of his death have been exaggerated, and we think that's the case here. But still, I, I thought it, it would be uh, an interesting exercise in just exploring the dynamics and the merits of dispensationalism. It was nothing of that, and, and I'll just be frank with you, we're going to return to this, that I was disappointed in the podcast in terms even of its spirit and its lack of fraternity and so on. But on the other hand, it's Dr. Moeller, and we all regard him tremendously. He's, a, he's a, obviously an intellectual giant. He's been a warrior for the truth in many ways, and, and, uh, uh, but, but none of that gives him cover for a careless, flippant, misrepresenting uh, uh, discussion of, of dispensationalism. And so I think what, I, what, what we would like to do, and Peter and I have talked this through, and what we would like to do is uh, 
is is use that podcast as something of a backdrop for our discussion because I know that so many listeners would have gone away with a real bad taste in their mouth about dispensationalism and with the impression, if not conviction, that a lot of things are about true about are, are true about dispensation, which simply are not. And so I don't I I, I don't want to we don't want to go through it point by point and respond. And we may make reference to some specific, and we already have in the t- clips from from uh, Dr. Moeller. But uh, more importantly, I think what we want to do is make the discussion what the discussion ought to be. If you are going to have a discussion between dispensationalism and non-dispensationalism, or even if it's not going to be polemical, if you're just going to try to analyze what dispensationalism is, the, the question before the House, and, and, and again, if there's some historical interest, that's fine, but, but the real issue is, is dispensationalism a legitimate way to read the Bible? That's the question. It was never referenced. It was certainly implied and suggested and, and so on that it is not on the podcast, but there was no discussion of what dispensationalism is or in what way it fails as a legitimate way. None of that. Now, I want to jump in here, too, yeah. and that's absolutely where, where I want to go with this. But one of the things I really want to clarify is that Daniel Hummel, I've watched a few of his interviews and he will flat out acknowledge that in his book, which, you know, again, that was kind of the motivation for that interview. Moeller read it and wanted to do that. Uh, Hummel acknowledges that, hey, listen, uh, I wasn't interested in evaluating something theologically, which in and of itself is probably a critique of his book, because you can't really, you know, claim to be writing history on dispensationalism without evaluating it to some degree. Yeah, exactly. And so... I, I do want to say I, I can affirm what he said on other interviews, but it really did seem that Moeller was taking the interview in a very negative direction. And that, uh, I think, leads us to that question is, according to Moeller, uh, dispensational, even the clips that we played, he said this is not a natural reading of Scripture. This is not what you would normally get to if you just unleash somebody with their Bible. So I guess we do have to ask, is dispensationalism a legitimate way to read Scripture? Yes, and that is exactly the question. And uh, uh, on the one hand, the because of Dr. Moeller's influence and reach, and because there was such an, I think, inaccurate and unhappy and unfair representation of what dispensationalism is, whereas I don't think it's going to be profitable or important to go back and try and point by point react to everything that's said, I, I, it is our intent to frame our discussion against the backdrop of that discussion. But we want to focus much more importantly on the question. And I'm going to say again, it is, I I cannot imagine that a believer can contemplate a more important question than this. How ought I to read the Bible? And if you're going to deal with dispensation, which is about nothing but how you read the Bible, there's nothing else and, and uh, it, it deserves a much fairer and judicious and fraternal hearing that it got. But having said that, that's going to be our focus. Right. Yeah, I think that's that's super important. And on that note, we, we listened to some clips that Mueller had on that, but we've also made reference to kind of the, the idea of polemical integrity, and those are kind of related, right? Mm-hmm. And I know you feel really strongly about this, and I do as well. What, what's kind of your take on, on how to conduct this kind of discussion? I think any—I don't care what it is you're talking about. You know, it, 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 if you have a sharp disagreement with someone— it's your, it seems to me, moral obligation almost to do everything you can to get inside that person's head and worldview and understand his position and even his evidences and his reasoning and so on from within that, and then step back and critique the whole package. But to approach the subject by presupposing that his ideas are totally bogus and then spend all of your time exploring how anybody could believe anything that's silly, which is pretty much the focus of the interview. And, and uh, so I, 
I, I, I think there were any number of ways. There were so many logical fallacies that were committed. There was so much ad hominem. There was so many red herrings. There was just uh, misrepresentation and so on. That was, was really, I, I don't know that it was malicious. I hope not, but it was careless. And uh, it, 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 it's inexcusable in the sense that the correct information that they were misrepresenting is so immediately available and so on, and, and, and available by people who are very, very well studied and can make the case. So you need to examine their case as carefully, honestly as you possibly can, and then give honest critiques. Now, again, I'm going to say, I think Hummel's book did not set out to do that by his own confession. But, and, and therefore, as you say, I think, uh, I mean, one of the things that really bothered me about Hummel's book is he begins with a long chapter on Philip Morrow, who was a dispensationalist, and then he abandoned it. And, uh, and he has all of these, uh, these phrases. He abandoned it because it was theologically incredible, because it was logically flawed. And, and so Hummel, in his book, has all these very brief quotes from Morrow to the effect that dispensationalism is in all of its parts intellectually and theologically bankrupt, but he never pursued any of them. So you had none of the reasoning, you had none of the arguments, you had none of the, the, the theological worldview of Philip Morrow himself that would drive him to that. And yet when you get to the end of the chapter, you're really impressed that dispensationalism is theologically bankrupt. Now, I just, as you say, I, I, I don't think there is, is integrity in that sort of approach, but Clearly, frankly, that's what Dr. Moore picked up on. Right. And, and his whole focus was that uh, dispensationalism is dead and it deserves to be dead. And why in the world would anybody believe such a system? Yeah. <laughs> and, and even, you remember the comment he made about the, uh, you can probably do better with this than I, with the, the man who wrote the book about the seven great men. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, I can't remember what his name was, though. I don't remember his name, but uh, this is terrible. But, but on the other hand, he, Moeller's point was that six of them were dispensationalism, and oh yeah, and five of them had been educated at his school before yeah, he Southern, was there, yeah. and uh, and 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 his his question was, we didn't teach him dispensationalism. How did he How did come they, to that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and 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 they have all sorts of really silly ideas as to how why people would believe this, you know, but. Uh, uh, I don't know. Well, a lot of times they just trace it right back to Darby. I mean, that was the big presupposition, which, you know, is the trump card for all presuppositions for non-dispensationalists is that something originated with Darby and he's, he's the figurehead of all of this. And so somehow, some way, everything filters down through him. But the reality is even, I actually appreciated, uh, Hummel, you know, I think it was, you know, there's a lot that I would disagree with Hummel's book, but there was some really fascinating stuff. He he had a really good section on James Hall Brooks, which, you know, listeners would know that he's one of the figures figureheads of the uh, premillennial resurgence in America. Now he wouldn't have called himself a dispensationalist because that term didn't come mm-hmm. up till later. But uh, James Hall Brooks, in his own personal testimony of how he became convinced of these viewpoints, which later become defined as dispensationalism, is he basically locked himself in a room and took his Bible with him and took all of the passages of Scripture that talked about the future return of Christ and examined them in details and said, this is what the Bible teaches. And Hummel kind of had like a funny remark on that saying, you know, something to the to the effect of whether or not uh, Brooks's assessment of his, you know, a journey to people details of his OK, you know, uh, and the assumption was kind of like he may have been influenced by uh, Darby. But that's a matter of debate. I mean, by his own admission, he Brooks says he wasn't. He says that he was just looking at scripture. Yeah. And and, and that was the point with uh, that's the point I took away with uh, Dr. Moeller's uh, appeal to these five gentlemen who had not been trained in it, but he came to it. And I remember sitting under W.A. Criswell because I was there at First Baptist for a lot of years. Uh, no, not for a lot of years, for three years, but they were his kind of his glory years. But uh, And I more than once heard him talk about the fact that his predecessor, George W. Truett, was, uh, was not a d- dispensationalist, you know, and, and, and he just decided to preach through the Bible. In the course of that, he became, and, 
And, of course, in another place, Moeller, and it's sort of a nod to dispensationalism, I guess. He acknowledges that most of the pastors who really were pivotal to the rescue of the Southern Baptist Convention were thinking, deliberate, preaching, teaching, dispensationalists, you know. And, and so, but, but, but he's mystified by it. He really is mystified by it. You know, and I, and I, I thought, you know, forgive the weak analogy, but, but, you know, you've got a neighbor who's a Mormon, and you, you give him a Bible, you know, say, just, you need to read this. And he comes back a couple of weeks later, a couple of months later, and he says, I've been reading that. And that's, that's true. You know what? I'm, I've yeah. become a believer. And so yeah. you go home and you say, now, I wonder what happened there. Maybe he was, you know, he was an orphan and maybe he needed a father figure and, you know, maybe, who knows, maybe the Spirit of God did his office work. Right. Maybe as he honestly read the Bible, and that's never even, as a matter of fact, one of the things that really struck me about Hummel's book, and I'm with you, I had higher regard for the book than I did for the podcast. Mm-hmm. I didn't agree with the book, but I realize it's a historiographical effort. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say even right with, with regard to Brooks, he spends a lot of time with his issue over slavery and right. reconstruction, and mm-hmm. he seems to suggest that somehow his reticence about, you know, full body, and then of course, again and again, it's uh, dispensationalism is 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 for white male Christians, right. and, and and all this sort of stuff. I I think those are absolutely fallacious conclusions. But as an effort in historiography, there were some fascinating. He did some right. nice research, but. Uh, but at any rate, the point is that he, it's almost he's he's deliberating the rise and fall of dispensationalism. So his issue to begin with is how did it? And he acknowledges it that it was absolutely the ruling construct, and it was an effective construct that missions and colleges and and you know exploded because during oh, those yeah. days, as George Eldon Ladd has acknowledged in other places. But but. Uh, but on the other hand, his question is, why Why did that happen? And he almost seems to be a religious naturalist, you know, that, like like the right. evolution is everything has to be the natural world. We've got to find some sociological, economic, so without spending altogether all too much time on it. But but one of the, one of the I think, debilitating, one of the, the elements of the podcast that was, I think, most disappointing and, and, and disappointing both in terms of the con, uh, of the podcast itself. And I, I, frankly, I would expect better of Dr. Albert Moeller. But one of the things is that there is no effort to analyze dispensationalism carefully and honestly. There is simply the effort to having presupposed that it's a bogus set of ideas. Right. How in the world did people fall for it? Well, and in the podcast, he actually asks uh, Hummel to define dispensationalism about halfway through after they've been, mm-hmm. you know, raking it through the coals for a while. And he says, well, I suppose I should ask you to define dispensationalism. And but this is the interesting part is that Hummel, because he's been approaching everything with a view to history rather than a view to theological evaluation, he basically starts saying, in all of my research, these are many of the things I've seen, but he starts listing things that I know you and I look at that and say, okay, that has nothing to do with a dispensationalist. I mean, that's more a product of that time in which those men lived rather than actually the system itself. Nobody denies that it's a set of ideas that matured and developed and so on and sometimes uh, had to, uh, you know, discard some some ideas and some emphases, and it was very conscious, and there was a great deal of what I would regard as happy, deliberate theological self correction. And uh, one of the things I think one of the dynamics of dispensationalism, which is at once, uh, it's it's uh, it is its greatest one of its greatest strengths, but it's perceived as its greatest weakness, is that it is very bottom up. It's it's people studying the Bible. It's not theologians who just work out a system and then dictate that to you. I say dictate, but you know it becomes kind of comes whole cloth. So, and I always said that a lot of dispensationalists' worst enemies are dispensationalists. Because you yep. get a lot of goofy ideas in the name of dispensationalism. Yep. And that's why we need to get to, we're going to, in just a moment, we're going to get to the issue of, all right, let's strip it all away and ask, what is dispensationalism in the interest of asking the question, is a legitimate way to read the Bible? Right, exactly. Yeah, and to your point of of just a lot of odd views kind of coincide with dispensationalism, I, in my research for baptism when I was doing all that, and he kind of blew me away that, you know, many of these early dispensationalists were paedo-baptists. And I was thinking to myself, how in the world can that coincide? 
But uh, like I, I couldn't agree with you more. And the way Mike Vlock says it, our good buddy Mike Vlock, he says dispensationalism is good because it has a self-correction built into it. Yeah, it's always yeah. checking. Yeah. It's not just assuming this is the there way is it is. There is no magisterium except the Bible. So right. everybody gets to check all of the particulars against the Bible. And because it is simply committed to reading the Bible for what it says, yeah, it's Oh, that's good. Well, let's 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 ask uh, you know, dealing dealing with whether or not dispensationalism is a legitimate way to read the Bible. Al Mohler says it's not natural. There are some there are some issues with it, and he brings up some of those. And so, how should we how should we think through some of that? Let's let's talk about some of the issues that. All they're right, talking this is about. what I think. Let's let's see if we can pursue it this way, Pete. On the one hand, if you sit and watch, and we both have the the podcast itself, there's no deliberate or sustained or even organized consideration of dispensationalism, its merits, its distinctive, and so on. Right. But there are, and, and I, I like to say that that podcast is not a an analysis of, di- of dispensationalism. It's a drive-by shooting <laughs> with a couple of guys with really noisy air rifles, but no bullets, you know. And, uh, oh, you're and, gonna get in trouble. You're gonna yeah, trouble. I know it. I know it. But the sights are really cockeyed, and yeah. so, <laughs> and so y- y- you get these these glancing blows, these passing references, and 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 th- again, they're never developed. But but th- I think they whether they are designed in point of fact, what they do is they leave a bad taste in your mouth about dispensationalism or in your mind or whatever. And so, but my thought is there are some. Issues that are substantive, they need to be talked about. And, and, and they may be entirely bogus, but by reason of the fact that they're so oft repeated, uh, it, it's, it's worth talking about them. So not necessarily in terms of the podcast, but to be sure, the podcast, Dr. Moeller makes much of his contention that, that, that dispensationalism is recent. As a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> Moll, uh, Hummel in his book, interestingly, refers to dispensational premillennialism as new premillennialism. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And he uses the word again and again, novel. Everything about it is novel. It's a novel right. way to read the right. Bible. It's a novel attitude toward church authorities and denominations and so yep. on. Now, from a historian standpoint, I, I, I think that reflects bad history as well as bad theology. But you talked a bit about this business of it being recent. I mean, well, you hear this all the time. Oh yeah, you you sure do. And in fact, well, I have many thoughts on this. I'll try to you know keep them concise. But there was actually so uh, I actually haven't had a chance to talk to you about this. So this will be new information for you good, too, good. Uh, mm-hmm. listeners and for you. But <laughs> eschatology matters is a YouTube channel. Some some of the listeners may be familiar with it. They focus on eschatology stuff. They usually come at it from a post millennial bent. But they actually had Corey Marsh from Southern California yeah. Seminary on there to talk to Dan Hummel about his book. And so it was, uh, I was think it was about an hour and 50 minutes I of discussion. I heard this going to happen, but I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, and so it just came out, I think, this week or end of last week. But but basically, it was a really substantive discussion where, where Marsh was able to push back a little bit on some of these things. And one of them was on this idea of it being novel. And in the interview, Hummel flat out said, uh, and again, this is where I don't know, you know, as he's writing or as the editor is going through how this gets passed, but Hummel flat out said, yeah, I would never say that the ideas originated with Darby. That's ridiculous. They, they pre-existed him. He's just coalescing a lot of it together. And it's interesting because that's not the feeling you get with the Moeller interview. <laughs> yeah. Moeller. It's not a feeling. Yeah, know? exactly. It's, it's... But it, it is interesting where, where yeah, he's, he, he's much more willing in that kind of environment where there's a congenial discussion to say, oh, yeah, no, I'm just trying to take Darby on and, and look at that as a historical movement. And, you know, taking him at his word for that. OK, I appreciate that. But still, I think it's the number one thing that that you and I hear and everyone online hears is that dispensationalism is new. It's the new kid on the block. It's the Johnny come lately kind of idea. And, uh, you know, I was actually as, as I was thinking about this episode, I called to mind that. um I don't know what episode this is, 155 or something, but I called to mind the 50th episode I did was actually a review of Ligon Duncan. And Ligon Duncan, again, another well-read, respected leader in the Reformed world, he he said it even more adamantly than I've heard, is he said, nobody ever believed these things prior to Darby. And I just remember thinking, and I said this on that podcast, you can check it out, episode 50, is there 
there are so many different ways to disprove this. You can disprove this just in the English language. And of course, uh, William Watson, who's one of our you know, uh, forerunners as far as uh, he's since passed, but he wrote this book and I just checked it out from the library because I was like, oh, this is a great uh, visual aid. Dispensationalism before Darby. I mean, what a great name. And it's, it's, it's copious. Oh yeah. It's, it's very. To the point of tedium, to be honest with you. But thorough. Exactly. He, and it's all researched and footnoted and it's stellar historical research. Oh yeah. And, and he just he just pours into English sources and shows how, uh, I think he, he has sources from the middle of the 17th century, which really you know demonstrate that there were people that believed in a pre-tribulational rapture. Mm-hmm. There were people that believed in a future for Israel, a return to Jerusalem, uh, you know, a, a difference between Israel and the church. I mean, these were not novel ideas with Darby. And then, of course, our, our, our friends from Southern California Seminary just this year uh, released a book, Discovering Dispensationalism. And in that, uh, our, you know, our friend and mentor in many ways, Larry Pettigrew has a chapter in mm-hmm. this book. And and they go basically all through the different time periods uh, from the first and second century on through uh, progressive dispensationalism, that era. And they just talk about the different uh, individuals in church history who have held to different dispensational. Now they, they, they say, okay, dispensationalism as a system or as a label doesn't come till later. We can all acknowledge that. That's fine. Wh- whatever. You know what? The dispensationalism that you and I would embrace is different from the one in the 1970s, for heaven's sake. Exactly. I mean, there are elements of what was absolutely intrinsic to the way it was discussed that I would say, Oh, the judgment and failure, th- you know, the trial and failure. That's it's oh, yeah. that nothing to do with it in time. So, and and by the way, that book, uh, Discovering Dispensationalism, is very, uh, you know, it's it's referenced on the with with some measure of contempt. You know, where well, is this book discovered? Oh yeah, so, yeah, exactly. But they don't take time to go through it and and and. And, and by the way, too, that book has very judicious arguments. They're not making wild claims about, you know, I can find you a chart from the 1500s, you know, with all stuff. Not, right. It's just they're showing that these ideas, which arise necessarily out of a simple, literal reading of the Bible, were were accepted in many quarters. Yeah. And if, if anyone's interested, too, I also, I did interview... Corey Marsh and James Fazio, who are the general editors of that volume, uh, we did, I think it was maybe like six episodes ago or something, we did a, a sit-down interview. They did a great job just just refreshing our minds, just making sure, hey, we're not saying that dispensationalism as a system was then, but we have dispensational thoughts and beliefs that we would hold to today. It's it's present back then. Even, well, even at lunch today, uh, Mike Vlock was telling me about, you know, reading some of the early church fathers, and he said, wow, this guy sounds so much like a dispensationalist, mm-hmm. it's unreal. Yeah. And let me just say, Pete, in your presence here, that I'm one of the biggest, you know, Bible Sojourner fans, as you know, so, and I <laughs> remember we very honored. well that uh, that interview with Ligon Duncan, and it was it was staggering, too, at this level, and this really, here we are being kind of equal opportunities, you know, critics, but but uh, he, too, could not define dispensation. Matter of fact, he he totally collapsed it to pre-tribulational rapture. He thought that was the whole thing. Oh, yeah. And, and yet he was, you were responding to a podcast in which his assignment was to explain dispensationalism. Right. It was really It is kind of ironic that is. this is this is what people are supposed to define and and you know I try to be forgiving you get on me for being too nice sometimes but <laughs> I think I think in a lot of cases uh, a lot of these people define dispensationalism according to what they were taught, you know, in the 60s or 70s about Darby. And that's that's it, what it's Darby true. believed is what dispensationalism is. But like we've been talking about, it's a system which has self-corrected. I mean, Darby had some crazy beliefs that nobody believes anymore. Yeah, and 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 yeah, and I I again I I incur, I concur in all of its parts, and I think it's it's this and and one of the most really disconcerting dynamics of this particular argument or this perpetually claim this is Charles Ryrie said this dripping faucet you know that the claim that that uh, dispensationalism is clearly bogus because it's so recent is that it is so manifestly untrue it is so easily disproven and so I go way back to what we were talking about before just real quickly and that is 
it, it, it reflects the fact that there is no effort being made to honestly understand what it is and then step back and criticize it. That's legitimate. We want that. Bring it on for heaven's right. sakes. But on the other hand, it's, it's these canards, these, uh, these red herring arguments and so on. But yeah, that's, I, I, when this book came out, discovering dispensationalism, it's, it's kind of ironic that we're having this, this, this conversation because I, I told some, some of my friends, I said, maybe now finally it can move to a substantive discussion about whether or not the theological realities and hermeneutical realities are important. But instead, here no, we are again no, talking about the no. same thing, whether or not it's a recent innovation. And, and, and like I say, the people who, who in this case on that podcast are insisting that uh, it is recent and therefore bogus, therefore it cripples it, they make a passing cynical offhand reference to that book and so they know it's out there yeah but uh well and and we've talked about this too i mean okay if you're gonna say dispensationalism is recent i mean covenant theology is it does it get a pass because it was 200 years before yeah just barely and 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 both hummel and well i know moeller is i'm not sure if uh, what what hummel's position would be but moeller is certainly historical premillennialist yeah well, that's pretty much George Eldon Ladd, for heaven's sakes, in the 1950s. I mean, so, so you know, he, he, he came up with that term, as I understand it, and popularized it and so on. So, uh, and, and here's the thing, too. Let's just remember our thesis, our commitment here, Pete, that regardless, I mean, okay, it's, it's frustrating that this keeps coming up, but the biggest issue is that whether or not it's recent has nothing to do with whether or not it's a legitimate way to read the Bible. Correct. And I don't care how recent it is. Now, anytime come, somebody comes up with some brand new, you know, that, that, that the 2,000 years of Christian erudition totally overlooked, I'm pretty suspicious. But if you can take me to the scriptures and say, there it is, well, I don't care how new it is. So it seems to me that, uh, and I have said for a long time, <laughs> and nobody listens, but I've said for a long time, that, man, we got all the high ground. You know, I mean, in terms of every exegetical, theological, historical, pastoral element and so on, we, the dispensationalism, which just simply is reading the Bible for what it says, has all the high ground. And uh, I, I think maybe the reason that that uh, its opponents, now again, maybe I'm getting beyond my, my proper kin here, but I think maybe the reason that its, its opponents so often revert to these, these kind of red herring uh, mischaracterization because it's pretty hard to make the case that reading the Bible for what it says is illegitimate. Right. Yeah. That's uh... all right. Let me take you to something else. And, and, and that is, this is another, so these are just kind of our broad rubric here is, uh, features or dynamics, elements of dispensationalism, which though not discussed on the podcast are at least uh, uh, you know, the, the, the guys with the noisy air rifles took a shot, you know? And, <laughs> and so, and another one is, and this was actually explicit. Now this, this really, it, it wasn't defended, but, but it, they returned to it several times. And that is, and Moeller made reference to this, that it's complicated, that it's so right, exactly. difficult and that nobody, like you say, could now, again, he's going to, I think, put the lie to this later in the podcast, but Moeller insisted nobody would simply read the Bible and come to this. Well, let me just say this, and I, and, and, and uh, without getting, we're going to come back to this uh, when we talk about dispensationalism and try and simply define it, but, you know, dispensationalism is simply a, a, an exercise in progressive revelation. That's all it is. Uh, what is the, what is progressive revelation? Just very quickly, hey, this is my, you know, a handy dandy. I go back to it all the time. Progressive revelation simply is the biblical, acknowledging the biblical reality that God did not back the 18 wheeler of revelation up to the garden of Eden, you know, just <laughs> plop. And now you dig your way through that. You know, I like to say God is an infinitely wise teacher and he knows he's dealing with almost infinitely slow students. And so as a wise teacher, God has parceled out truth. Now, nobody denies this. And all that, that's so clear in the scripture. There are, and, and some people have the idea that God has been just kind of constantly revealing himself up until, no, there have been seasons of revelatory activity. And when there was a season where God uh, gave new revelation, uh, I like this, the idea of a stair step. 
And so wherever you are, God has given that revelation, and you are responsible for that. God gives more revelation, and to be sure, that takes you to a level of, uh, of, of, of truth. That, and, and wherever you are, and I like the stair-step figure, if you don't mind, if you can picture that in your mind, because uh, the point to be made is that you can't get to this stair step without what went before. So everything builds because progressive revelation, this is going to become important, is always from truth to greater truth. It's never from error to truth. It's never from deliberate divine misrepresentation, but I'll straighten it out later for you, truth. It's truth to greater truth. And so everything builds on that which, which went before. And wherever you are, whether it's in the garden, whether it's immediately after the fall, before the revelation of the flood, so there, there are stages of revelatory activity, or not seasons of revelatory activity that take you to progressively greater and more blessed and more uh, satisfying, if you don't mind, uh, soul-satisfying stages of, of revelation. And wherever you are, this is all dispensationalism is, wherever you are, you're a steward of that revelation. That's, that's all it means, because w- w- what does the word dispensation mean? It, dis- it means stewardship. So, Moeller says it's so complicated. No, it's, it's very, very simple, and we're going to say a little later that at its essence, ontologically, it's simply a commitment to read the Bible for what it says. But the way it works itself out in the course of Bible study is you're going to trace the progress of revelation and acknowledge that man is a stewardship. So now some people have different breakdowns, and you'll have seven. And and, and the word dispensation was introduced, evidently, according to Hummel by Morrow himself. And and if I could go back in my, you know, way back machine or whatever, you know, I might choose a different word, you know, but uh, it's pretty, it's not very helpful. But it's not complicated. It's not esoteric. It's not, it's not some grand system. It's simply saying, all right, let's go to the scriptures and trace the progress of revelation and, and understand that that's exactly what it is. That's God carefully teaching us about himself, about his purposes, about his demands, about one step at a time. I love the story of the new tribes. You know, the new tribes people that used to have a gospel presentation. A guy I was up in Philadelphia, one of their training camps one time. I was just visiting, thank you. But uh, uh, I wasn't learning to, you know, you know, butcher an animal or whatever. But, uh, but at any rate, I, I had a nice conversation with one of the leaders, and he was telling me that they had had uh, a, 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 a way of presenting the gospel, and they would start with John and so on, and they realized that, that it really wasn't working, that people were just kind of adding Jesus to their God shelf and so on. So they totally revised it. There's a video on this. I love the video. And they talk about how they decided what we're going to do is we're going to just go through dispensationalism, essentially. So the first thing they do is they teach creation. And now you got this God, and you answer to him, and he made you perfect, and he's a good God. Then they teach the fall. Now you've got, and, and they just, you know, then they, you got the law, what the law is about. And I love what they do because they, he said that they would get up to Jesus, and you have all this anticipation, all this prophecy, all these events and so on, and they would get up to the story of Jesus, and they would walk through the Gospels, and they would always contrive to have him go home after a lesson on the crucifixion because, uh, you know, th- th- their, their response was, oh, no. We thought this was the one. Yeah, this can't be. You know, and so they're just broken. And then he says they come back and they talk about the resurrection. So they had to actually live through. Now my point is, you know why that's so effective? Because that's God's curriculum. That's how He has chosen to teach the human race about Himself. And I, it's not, it's not. Are there questions along the way? And can you run in a lot of different directions, cross currents, and so of course. But the simple idea that God reveals himself progressively. Those progressive stages of revelation are recorded in the scripture, and it's good to understand that at every point, man is a steward. That's, that's all dispensationalism is. Hmm. And, and so this, this canard that it's complicated, and I, I, it really, I don't know, I, I, you hate to analyze the, <laughs> the, uh, the podcast entirely in terms of the most stunning, disappointing moments with regard to Al Mohler, but for him to say it's complicated, and then to say covenant theology is just two covenant, two testaments. You got the Old Testament. What in the world? You know, that's right. That's got almost nothing to do with covenant theology, to be honest with you. 
So, and then the other canard that you hear all the time is that it's a system imposed on the Bible. Exactly. It is anything but that. But I would say every non-dispensational system or approach or construct is exactly that. It's, it's imposed. Even by admission. Yeah. Like one of the, I don't know if you, um, you know, I do appreciate that you listen to the Bible Sojourn. That honors me. <laughs> um, those episodes that I did on the, on the biblicism. And again, it wasn't to necessarily define saying we should all just try to claim the label of biblicisms, but there's a huge movement today that pushes and says, we need to impose our theology on the text and we read Explicitly. scripture through. And, and that's a huge presuppositional difference. Oh, oh, listen. Well, you Don't get it. you started on it. Don't get you started. <laughs> exactly. We'll come back to it. But I like to say that that a scientist does not go into a laboratory to look at a microscope through a bug. <laughs> right? And you look at a bug through a microscope. And dispensationalism is all about one thing, looking at your theology through the Scripture. And and to impose that is 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 silly tantamount to the micro you know the, the the scientist looking at a, at a at a microscope through a bug and and yeah so uh i i so that's another the 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 idea that it's recent and then the idea that it's complicated now one other two other things real quickly and we can be quick with these but uh one is that um it's not it's not embraced by primary academic evangelical voices. Right. You want to respond to that? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think there could be multiple. And again, I'm trying to assume the best about people here. Like I, I, I think when, when you're making that kind of assessment that, okay, this, this viewpoint isn't represented either in the majority or among the elites, what you're assuming, at least hopefully, is that there are faithful brothers and sisters that are in the academy and they've, they've, weeded through the issues and they don't find it convincing. And so they're embracing other things, which automatically disproves this because the best of us isn't embracing it. But I mean, think about what we're doing here. We're talking about the best of the best, Al Mohler. And he didn't really even understand what dispensationalism yeah, yeah. was. So that doesn't give me much hope for many of the elites in these academic institutions. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the track record is not good from our perspective. And by the way, we should acknowledge to the audience that we are pretty Deliberate I think they figured that right? out. They figured that out. But let's put our cards on the table. But uh, but see, I, I think the other thing is this in this regard, and I want to come back to this before we're done. But but this idea that truth is best protected, best preserved, best developed, best presented in the academy is absolutely devastatingly dangerously. Wrong. Well, that was true with Jesus and his disciples, didn't you know that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, and and and, and I'm going to go back to it again and again. But Paul says in First Timothy that the church is the pillar and ground of the church uh, of the truth. Now, I'm telling you, people who are listening to me say that quote that verse out of First Timothy three fifteen are saying, well, of course that's the universal church that include the creeds and the fathers and so on. The most kindergarten exegesis would demonstrate that that cannot be anything but the local church. Because you remember, Paul had written about, about proper doctrine in the, in the church. He had written about proper decorum and dressing in the church and the role of women in the church. He'd written about who can be the pastor, who can be the bishop, and who can be the deacon. And then what he says explicitly to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 is, I went to come to you soon, but in case I can, I've written to you that you might know how to, de- how to behave. Your- I've written these things onto you in order that you might know how to behave yourself in the church the living God, which is the pillar and ground of the truth. So, you know, who can be bishop? Who can be the bishop of the church? Now, is that universal church? I, I've, I've met some men who were willing to candidate for the position, but, but, but no, clearly that's local church. And there is such bottomless, infinite, delightful genius in this because God crafted this local church where Jew and Gentile, the middle 
wall of partition is torn down, and by the blood of Christ they're made one new man. And the angels, according to Ephesians 3, the angels who watch God spin the earth into, into existence with his, the word of his mouth are staggered once again with his wisdom when he's able to develop this local church. And, and now this church lives its life out, the, the people live their life out in their community. And, and, and what's beautiful about that, sta- that, that statement, by the way, in 1 Timothy 3, is that in that culture, the pillar normally didn't hold anything up. Most pillars were just decorative. But a, the pillar was the primary means to beautify a building, a, a Solomon's temple. There were two pillars. They weren't holding anything up. And the Hiram sent special workmen to craft those two pillars, which are named. I don't remember their name. Do you remember their names? Uh, Boaz and something. Yeah. But, but I mean, they don't hold anything up, but they make the building beautiful. They draw the eye. They make it attractive. And so if the church is going, I'm sorry, if the truth is going to be made attractive, it's through the ministry of the local church. And, and, and God never raised up anything else. I always say, we work for a seminary. God never raised up seminaries. He raised up churches. Now, churches raised up seminaries, and we think there's a, 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 a careful place for them. But, but not only is the local church the pillar so it holds it up, the truth, of the truth. It, it makes it beautiful, but it's the ground. It's the buttress. It what's keep it secure. And we'll say this later, but, but you... When it comes to the business of preserving the truth, of even analyzing the truth, are we advantaged to have scholars such as Mike Flock, Pete Gaiman, Andy Smith? We got some amazing scholars at our seminary. I'm not one of them, but <laughs> but uh, I'm just a Bible. Th- I, mean, I, 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 I don't. That's not. I'm I'm not nearly as humble as I just made it sound. But but the point is that there's a place for scholarship, and and we rejoice over it, but. The local church is the pillar and ground, and, and just twice-born people gathering regularly, taking care of one another, open Bible on their laps, spirit-enabled teachers who are fully qualified, who know enough to teach others also, and week by week going through the scriptures, and like you say, it's, it's self-correcting, actually asking the question, all right, this is what we all believe. Is that legitimate? There's the text. That's the way, that's where we ought to put our confidence. So this idea, and I was struck with this too, uh, really, with Hummel's book, that to him, Christianity, in all of its parts, ecclesiology, theology, was the domain of the academy and the fathers. That was his point of reference for, you know, the, the creeds, the fathers, and then the, the elites, the high priests, as you say. I think there's much to be learned cautiously from those high priests, from those elites, from those special scholars, but that's not the measure. And that's why I say that the idea, and it was never stated, I don't think, as clearly as this, but you definitely got the impression that uh, dispensation is a little bit to be ashamed of because no big seminaries embrace right. it. And, and of course, that's where he got his idea of the fall. Right. His whole point that the that dispensationalism is now gone, it's a it's a it's a museum artifact, is is the fact that up until the nineteen nineties it had a strong there were some strong seminaries who were impacting the evangelical world. And and again, I think Paul Weaver, my dear friend who also did a podcast on that, he'd be a little disappointed. Matter of fact, he's disappointed. He pushes back against the idea that Dallas is no longer dispensational. But nonetheless, that's that's his point that that uh for whatever set of, now nah, I want to say reasons, but but however thin he slices it, you know, so progressive dispensationalists are not real dispensationalism, and John MacArthur is not a dispensationalist because he 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 took the lordship salvation side and so on. Some of that's fairly self-serving in in in, in terms of trying to make the case that dispensationalism is gone, but but and and one of the things I very much appreciated about. Uh, another podcast that my friend Paul Weaver did called uh, 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 Bible and Theology Matters. And uh, he had a number of very, very, uh, I mean, they, they'd be a little, uh, uh, you know, they wouldn't want me to blow their horn quite as I am, but really effective teachers and ministers who work with New Tribes Mission. What's the new name? I always forget. Yeah, I can't remember. But, but, and, and he listed, and, and Paul Weaver, who worked all those years with Word of Life, with 18 campuses around the world and tens of thousands of believers being educated and, and churches being started and so on, 
all by absolutely committed theology. I'm sorry, dispensationalism is the water they swim in. It's the air they breathe. They don't, you know, and yet we're told that it's dead because it's not in the academy. You know, it doesn't have a voice in the academy it once did. Well, and I think their their point, which I think is fine to talk about, is that it can't propagate if you don't have a voice in the academy. Nobody will learn it because and. I think like what you're saying, I don't think that's necessarily true. I mean, the church lives. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, I, I just, I, I tell people all the time, don't place your hope in the academy. The academy is, is, it's frankly. The Germans did that for quite a long time. That's right. And, and uh, it didn't turn out that well for us. So, yeah. But all right. One other thing, and we're getting along here, but one other, when I say thing, one other issue that deserves to be mentioned at least briefly by us here is their their suggestion if not explicit uh, insistence that dispensationalism is inordinately focused on Israel right and 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 now this can go a lot of different directions but that is a criticism to which I will happily confess okay that I don't think it's inordinate but the Bible, the narrative of Scripture is about God's relationship, his covenant relationship with one people, and that people is Israel. And, and his relationship is not born of any special merit or desert. How many times does he say this as explicitly as concerned? And as a matter of fact, I'll just say real in passing, there are those, and there's a whole theological system built on this, who insists that that the fecklessness and the faithlessness and the rebellion and the the stiff neckedness of Israel that was on display so dramatically again and again uh, actually got so bad that that um, uh, it exhausted God's patience and it became somehow so he abandoned them and he divorced and, them and there he you divorced yeah. them and found himself a new Mrs. Hosea and that sort of thing and 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 I think it's so important to understand that God's relationship with Israel is not to the glory of Israel, it's to the glory of God. Right. And what is on display is, in fact, his covenant-keeping nature. And only against the backdrop of that rebellious spirit that manifests itself can we really appreciate how what an what a, what a absolutely dependable covenant-keeping God Yahweh is, as his name suggests, by the way. And, and, and you know, in my mind... You know, the reason you and I, Pete, can lay our head on a pillow at night and sleep in comfort is because we believe God keeps his word. Amen. And it's a simple promise. And you know, whoever believes is not, is not condemned. You know, it shall not perish. Well, that, that's fairly simple. And, and it's by reason of the fact that God has demonstrated himself in large part, by the way, in, 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 in his dealings with Israel, to be a God who keeps covenant. And so this idea that there's an inordinate focus on Israel, number one, the Bible is about Israel, for heaven's sakes. Let's, let's, let's just put it on the record, especially the Old Testament, but even the New Testament is—I is, uh, won't get into that over much. But uh, what's at stake is—and and this is—I had a friend tell me one time, and he was quite upset with me because I, I pursued this argument, but he said, you know, Bookman, you love, you love Israel more than you love Jesus. No, I don't love Israel more than I love Jesus. But— Almost everything I know about a triune God, I know by reason of his dealings, Genesis 12 and on, with this people, Israel. That's a good point. And, and I can't, I, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I, and I'll say, I'll say for the record, and this is not going to be true across the board of, of my fellow, dis, well, it, I, I, I love Israel. I love the state of Israel. I, I'm not Pollyannish about it. I do believe that God is, in fact, uh, sinners and bones are coming together, though there is no spirit in them, and so on. But uh, uh, and I, I'll say one other thing too: if the case can be made, no, I don't think the case can be made. If the charge, if the accusation can be made that the dispensationalist has too high a regard for Israel, I think it can be made as well that the non-dispensationalism has a rather stunning disregard for Israel. In, yeah. in spite of the fact that Paul warned against that specifically, don't you be, you know, uh, how does he say it? You know, boasting yourself against the natural branch. Right. If you've got a theology that says God rejected Israel and I now have those promises, that might fall under the category of boasting yourself against the natural branch, you know, so. Yeah. 
Well, book, this has been really good. I think I think this has been helpful. We're not done. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna record a part two to this episode, but I think this is a good break for people. Uh, they've had enough of us at this point. That's so right. so we're gonna record a part two and we're gonna address specifically how we ought to define dispensationalism and, and what the true issue behind that is and then what do non-dispensationalists do? What uh, what defines dispensationalism and then what differentiates a non-dispensationalist? And Bookman has promised me that uh, you're going to be really upset with us for doing that. So so in any case, if you want to find out more about either of us, you can visit shepherds.edu. That's the website for Shepherds Theological Seminary where we both teach. You can also find out more about Bookman and his Israel trips there. And if you want to reach out to me, you can always look at the Bible Sojourner website at peteryeman.com and you can fill out the contact form on the website and I'd be happy to respond at some point. But uh, my emails get backlogged, so you might be waiting just a few months. It's, it's just how it works. In any case, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.